Welcome to uh, the last Haftorah of Sefer Breshit. Um, we are in luck this week because the um, Haftorah comes from uh, Malachim, which is just an interesting story, uh, juicy details. Um, and I apologize, I didn't share the story sheet beforehand. Let me, sh I'm going to share my screen, but I'll share, um, I'll share the link to the Google Docs, should you prefer that. Um, and so the the Haftorah connection between um, the Torah reading and the Haftorah is that um, in both cases, uh, a patriarch has gotten older. So it, Yaakov in the case of um, the Torah and uh, David HaMelech in the case of the Haftorah. And in both cases, they are delivering their deathbed wishes um, and maybe brachot in the case of Yaakov uh, and, and uh, David, right? Yaakov is speaking to his 12 children and um, David is speaking just to, to Shlomo, his heir uh, to the throne. Okay, so I posted this first sheet there and now I'm going to share my screen. And... <laughs> he, David shares some very beautiful pieces, of course, which are not interesting to me, but I encourage you to read them during the Haftarah about how if we will walk in, you know, if Shlomo will walk in the ways of the Torah, he'll be very successful and, and his um, throneship will be very successful and all of that is beautiful. And we know that that will be true. But then he, he mentions a few weird pieces of business where he wants, it's almost, it reminds me of like those last minute pardons that presidents do right before they leave office. Office, right he uh, he offers two people protection and he asks Shlomo to like take care of two people um and at first I had this very ambitious goal that we were going to look at all of their stories and I quickly realized that Yoav was probably ambitious enough as it was um so we're going to stick with Yoav um but all of them have really fascinating backstories um and a lot of you know, it's a lot of uh, family trees and like past history to uncover. So what I hope we'll do now is we'll look at the prompts from the Haftorah, and then we'll look at um, a very limited selection of um, Sukim from Shmuel Aleph and Shmuel Bet that traces Yoav and David HaMelech's relationship. So sort of try to understand what's going on, why Yoav is the one who makes it to the top of the list of the people to uh, not be pardoned, why maybe David doesn't just take care of business himself, um, and and what like the sort of the repercussions are. And I feel like this is like my standard template uh, disclaimer at the beginning of Haftarah this year. Um, I will just say, I, I think what also what really drew me to the storyline was that I see a lot of echoes in our modern Israeli history. And I don't want to I, I don't want to say like who reminds me of who or which pieces. It's all like sort of a mishmash. But a few times I was like, wow, that really sort of resonates. So I guess to me that was underlying, but I certainly don't want Israel to be like the dominating piece of our discussion. So I probably won't say it again, but if you see it and you want to mention it, please feel free. Um, and lastly, I will give credit where it is due to Dr. Miriam Gedweiser, who is an amazing Torah scholar, friend, and uh, colleague who wrote a series on the 929 website about Yoav and David's relationship. And I relied heavily on her, her 10 piece uh, essays to, to put this together. Okay, now on to the show, as they say. Um, so in Malachim Aleph, um, this is the fifth pasuk of the Haftorah. It's a pretty short Haftorah, it's only 12 pasukim. And um, David, speaking to Shlomo, says, Right, you know what Yoav, the son of Tzriya, did to me. So first of all, I think already it's interesting. It's Asher Asali, what he did to me. But really, what is it he did? It's really what he did to the two commanders, right? Avner, the son of Ner, and Amasa, the son of Yeter. He killed them, shedding blood of war in peacetime. He stained the girdle of his loins, his clothing. Um, so his clothes on his his feet and the, or on his legs and the stanzels on his feet with the blood of war. So on the one hand, he committed murder, right? He killed Avner, he killed Amasa. We'll see who they are and why he killed them. Um, but it really seems to be that David like feels this personally. It's not just about pardoning or not pardoning. In some way, either shedding blood of war in peacetime 
or these two particular characters um, felt like a personal loss to David HaMelech. So who is Yoav, right? So, so generally speaking, I will say that Yoav is David's general. That's sort of what we know about him. Um, but it's interesting that the first mention of him in uh, the Navi is here, uh, back in Shmuel Aleph, where David is actually speaking to other people, right? Vayan David Vayomer el Achimelech Achiti ve'el Avishai ben Shruya Achi Yoav Lemor, right? So he's giving directions to Avishai, Yoav's brother. And it's, it's interesting, um, uh, Yoav has two brothers that are sort of relevant to the storyline, Avishai and Asha'el. Um, and uh, Tsruya, uh, Divrei Hayamim believes, is the sister of David HaMelech. So this is a very close family relationship. David's general is actually his nephew. Um, and what we see in this pasuk already is that Yoav's relationship to his brother is like very much intertwined with who he is. He doesn't get his own introduction. Um, and what um, Dr. Genweiser suggests is that it's also like Yoav is always there. He never got an introduction, and yet he is the way that uh, Avishai is introduced, right? It's it's sort of a funny thing. It never says, and Yoav was David's general, who was also his nephew, or who, you know, was brave in battle. And then later we say, oh, Yoav's brother Avishai. Yoav's brother is like, that's just assumed. Everyone knows Yoav. He's always around is sort of the, the feeling perhaps in this pasuk. So both that he's very connected to his brother or brothers, and also that um, he's sort of a constant presence, I think is what we see here. Um, okay, <laughs> on to the next. So then what we're going to see is we're gonna enter the period of like what I would call generals behaving badly. Um, there is still a, um, a real um, argument, a real debate, a real vying for power uh, going on between um, Shaul, right, the, the previous king or the king, and David at that time. Um, and um, the, the um, Avner is the general of Shaul. Um, and then he becomes the general of Ishboshet, who is Shaul's son because he doesn't want to be out of a job, right? When Shaul sort of concedes, um, all of a sudden, uh, Avner says, well, Ishboshet, why don't you step up? You're the king's son, right? Because he wants to continue to be the general of the king, and he knows that he doesn't have a chance to do that with David. So in some ways, right, we're playing with the, like, distinction between king and general, um, who's in charge, who sort of leads the way, who's acting upon whose orders. Um, Avner definitely seems to be in charge. Yoav seems much more to be someone who is um, fighting for his country, a true patriot, um, not about him and his own honor. Um, but Avner uh, basically calls um, out to Yoav um, to, to have like a, a duel. 12 of his men and 12 of Yoav's men should meet together in this one place and they're going to fight it out and they'll see who deserves to take the kingdom. And in a, a really a horrible tragedy, all 24 men die. They all managed to kill each other before succumbing to their own wounds, I guess. I have some questions logistically about how that happened. Um, and it, it starts a civil war. This is like the beginning of a true deepening uh separation between the two um, families and the two kingdoms. Um, and um, Asha'el, Yoav's brother, right? So he has Avishai that we meet up here and Asha'el. Asha'el is one of the soldiers. He runs after Avner and he um, tries to kill him, right? Because that's like the best prize of the enemy camp is the general. And, and Avner kills Asha'el in self-defense, which the text is, is careful to say, right? This was too much text to put here. So it's more like a story that I'm trying to convey. So this weird little skirmish between two opposing camps turns into a civil war in which Asha'el dies by the hands of Avner in self-defense. And Yoav runs after Avner, and corners him, and he could kill him at that very moment in the heat of battle and war. Um, but Avner appeals to Yoav's patriot self, is how I would say. Um, he says, <laughs> Must the sword devour forever? Basically saying, like, this is, will not be good for the country if you kill me now. We have to, um, like, do what's best 
for the country. Let's stop fighting. This is like a curious time to choose to do what's best for the country, right? When he's about to be killed by the opposing um, troops. But Yoav, uh, he accommodates that desire, right? I think it speaks to him. Yoav is someone who really wants what's best for the kingdom. And if he thinks that that's what Avner thinks, then he says, okay. And he sounds the horn and all the troops halt. Um, and uh, the they ceased their pursuit of Israel and they stopped the fighting. Right. So, so far we've seen Yoav, who is a very close brother, and we can only imagine how he feels right now, knowing that Avner has killed his brother Asha'el, even if it was in self-defense. But he's able to sort of put aside his own personal feelings, and he's able to stop fighting and not kill Avner because he thinks it's for the better of the country. Um, which is is like a really hard thing. I think Yoav comes off sounding um good here is sort of how I I feel about it um and you might think that that would sort of be the end and like wouldn't that be wonderful Yoav would be the better person um Avner would sort of go off licking his wounds and and David could go to to you know govern the country again um however um it doesn't work out that way because for some um, complicated and long reasons, which we have to skip to make this fit into even 45 minutes, um, Avner tries to jump ship. Ish Boshet is losing. He sees the way things are going and he goes to David and he says, hey, I could be a really good general for you too. And David, for whatever reason, says, okay, fine, maybe that would be fine. And Avner is, uh, and Yoav is really upset, right? Personally, his brother uh, was killed by Avner. Professionally, Avner is also a head general. So if, if David Hamel takes him on the team, what does that say for his head generalship, right? Um, and then the third uh, possible reason is that he does feel like perhaps um, Avner is a, is a double crosser, right? He was so quick to distance himself from Ish Boshet. Maybe sort of on a more national level, he thinks, well, what happens when something happens to David and Avner is so quick to leave again? So, right, so Yoav sees something troubling. He was the bigger person. He didn't kill Avner. But then when Avner is sort of invited to join the team, that seems to be too much for Yoav. And so what does he do? Um, and, and the text is clear to tell us that David HaMelech knew nothing about it. David lo yeza. V'yashav Avner Chavron. Um, he returned when Avner returned to Hebron. Yoav el toch hasha'ar ledaber ito basheli. He goes to talk to him privately. It's like as though he's saying, like, "Hey, welcome to the team. Come on in." But then, what does he do immediately? Ve'akehu sham hachomesh ve'yamat. Uh, did I skip up right there? Um, oh no, sham hachomesh ve'yamat bedam asael achiv. And he uh, strikes him in the belly and Avner dies for shedding the blood of Ashel Yoav's brother. So what does it sound like here? Which of the reasons has risen to the top here? The personal one, right? It doesn't say Avner died because he might double cross David later or Avner died because Yoav wanted to keep his job and ranking. It seems to be all about his brother here, right? It's a personal vendetta. Um, and in fact, David Hamel is really angry about it. And you can imagine sort of the, the PR nightmare, as Miriam uh, Gedweiser calls it, right? How is David going to explain to the people why one of his generals is killing another one of his generals in cold blood, in broad daylight, in front of everybody? Um, <laughs> and it seems like it's personal, not professional. And he, and he gets very upset and he curses Yoav. And he gives him this sort of weird curse um, he says, um, let's see, Vishma David, right? David hears, um, and he uh, says, right, quickly, Vayomer Nakia Nochi, right? I am innocent. I had nothing to do with this plan. How quickly he is to distance himself from, from trouble, so to speak. Um, uh, the El Kolbeit Aviv Al Yichorit Mi Beit Yoav Zav Umetzora Umachzik Bapelach Menofel Bachera Bchasar Lahem, right? May the um, May the guilt fall upon the head of Yoav and all his father's house. May the house of Yoav never be without someone suffering from a discharge or an eruption or a male who handles the spindle, which seems to be unfortunately like emasculating a man. That's what that means, that men would be doing women's work or one slain by the sword or one uh, lacking bread. And 
to me, this is like very heartbreaking, right? Yoav has been with him for so long. He's done so many good things for him. And it just seems like at that time, David just has to totally distance himself. In a way, that's very harsh. Like these are harsh uh, insults, especially at this time, right? These are like the worst things he could call him. And at the same time, what Yoav does is very troubling to me. Why didn't Yoav, you know, take him to the international, you know, criminal court? Why didn't he report him to David? Why didn't he do any number of things? It just, it feels, um, you know, when I was rereading this, this parak, when I was looking at it, like it was shocking to me. Every time it's shocking to me. Oh, he takes him aside under this ruse of privacy and then he kills him immediately in this like really violent way. So I think we start to see that there are sort of more questions and answers when it comes to Yoav and to David. Um, because certainly, even if David thought Avner might be a good general, this is not like the worst thing that could happen to David because it's not really his general. It, like he just became his general and maybe he's double crossing him for Yish Boshed and maybe he's just a bandwagon fan, but he's certainly not like his best friend. So this is a strong reaction, I guess is what I'm saying. Um, okay, we're going to hurry along on our journey here. Um, now, um, I want to look at one piece where I think we really see like a weird interdependence that has formed between Yoav and David. Lots of things happen in between, um, right? I think that it's important to note um, there's the whole conflict with Uriah and Bathsheba where David um, sends Yoav. Yoav is the messenger sent to um, make sure that Uriah dies in battle so that uh, David can have Bathsheba. It seems like Yoav is not really comfortable with it, yet he does it anyway, ever the faithful soldier. Um, then we come to a, a place in the battle where it says that Yoav attacks, right? Yachim Yoav. And he's the one, he captures the royal city. And he even frames it that way to David, right? He says, um, I have captured the city. And then it says that um, David wants to go and capture the city himself. Right, David, uh, David at Kohaam, he musters his troops. Uh, so it seems like why would David have to capture the city from Yoab or right, um, or attack it again? It seems like this has already been done, but there's this weird kind of interdependence. Both David and Yoab want to be the ones who get the credit, or maybe they want to feel like they're in charge. It seems like after. Yoav kills Avner, we start to see some more cracks, right? It's not so simple to have a general and a king work together in some ways. Um, and it's not like a fight between them, but it does seem like there's some jockeying that starts to happen here. Um, now, again, we're going to have to like flash forward through a few pieces of history, um, but there we now come to the really, I think, one of the tragic parts of history, which is where Avshalom tries to um, take over for uh, the kingdom from his father, right? He doesn't like that Shlomo is the heir apparent, and so he gets involved. Um, and uh, Yoav has to go do battle with Avshalom. But David HaMelech is now, it's David who's the one who allows his personal feelings to sort of jump into play, right? Because what are his orders about battle? It's not about like tactical advances and what are the best ways to go about it and which troops should be where. Um, he just says, La'at li la'nar la'avshalom, uh, just be, deal gently with my boy, Avshalom. Right, such a such a hard thing to say. You can't like lo alenu that we should any ever have to imagine having to say such a thing. Like, please go stop this insurrection, but deal gently with my my son, the head of the insurrection. All the troops here, <clears throat> right? Important to note, this is totally crystal clear. It's not like he mumbled it in the back of the room. <laughs> but then what happens? What happens just a few psukim later is that um, someone says, right, um, Absalom had this very long hair and he gets stuck in this tree. And when when someone tells him that he's like basically stuck, he's been trapped, Yoav says to him, um, ra iti umado lo hihito, sham arza, right? 
Um, you saw him struggling and trapped and weak. Why didn't you kill him, right? The point is to finish this war, to finish this, smush this insurrection. Um, and the man says, well, wait a second. I can't raise a hand against the king's son. The king said not to, <laughs> right? Yoav is um, ignoring the order, but the pasuk goes out of its way to say, wait a second, like, we're not supposed to do this. But what happens? Avner says, well, I'll just go do it myself then. And he takes three darts, and he strikes Absalom, and um, he's still alive when he falls down. And the rest of Yoab's, you know, men sort of take care of the ends. But ultimately, Yoab kills Absalom, who is David's son. And I think that here we see, right, Yoab has totally forgotten about like the personal pieces of war, the personal pieces of all of these entanglements, and he is serving kingdom over king, right? This was what was best for the kingdom, but it is certainly not what was best for David HaMelech. And I don't think that David is ever able to let go of that. Um, and so it's hard, it, you know, it's hard to see it's hard to say what what, what happens um, after that for for David and for for Yoav, but we see that Yo that David makes another strange move, perhaps in grief. Because let's remember that now he's mourning his son who has just been killed. Um, but uh, Amasa, the other person that was um, mentioned in our Haftorah, is uh, Absalom's former general, and. Uh, David suggests that Absalom's former general become an army commander Tachat Yoab in place of Yoab, which is a really weird thing. It feels like totally personally punitive to Yoab because Absalom, Am Amasa staged the coup with Absalom. That's like a really weird move to then invite him to be your head general. It's like even more than with Avner, um, I think in some ways. And so it does feel like maybe like Yoab just had to go and Amasa was the first in line, and, and that's all he could do. Um, so now we see, this is the exciting part, if you have been bored thus far, hopefully not. Oh, um, I think it's a riveting narrative. Um, this is when Yoav kills Amasa, um, right? So we're uh, um, in Shmuel Bet, Perikaf, and there's a lot of sort of echoing of the, oh yeah, please, Tamar, go ahead. Um, I want to go back just a bit. David asks the men not to be rough with the Na'ar. He calls him a Na'ar. How old was Avshalom at this time? I don't, think he, I don't think he was a boy, but I'm asking. I don't know. It's a great question. I don't know the answer. I will say that I heard it as like the way that sometimes parents talk about grown children as their kids or their, you know, their That's boys or girls or whatever exactly. it is. That's exactly what I'm wondering about, whether this was a father talking about a 30 or 40 year old son. And to him, he's he's the Na'ar, he's the boy. That was very what? touching. If that's if that's the case, if he was fully mature and his father's calling him Na'ar, I found that very moving, very touching. Yeah. That that's how I read it too. And I think you're right. Like it, it further pulls at your heartstrings in such a real way. Even if he's 40, right? That David sees him as a little boy and wants, right? I think deal gently is also such like a interesting personal phrase, right? Don't like have mercy on him or spare him the death penalty or, you know, bring him to me alive. There are so many ways to like sort of say that less, less intimately than David does. I mean, I, I guess in, in the Nubby's time, he could have been 18 or 19 maybe, but still at that time, that was like, that was grown. He's Wikipedia, able to get an insurrection. Wikipedia <laughs> says he was 31. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think and you're I, right, Samar. I think that calling him a Na'ar is definitely displaying that emotional connection for sure. Well, or it's it's that, you know, he didn't, He's still treating him as a child, even though he's rebelling sort of thing. And that's a whole different way we can go in this story is David's parenting. But mm -hmm. I'll get us off track if we go there, right? <laughs> I'm telling you, it's so, it's like rich, but in for, for me, it's like sometimes it feels like like the train wreck you can't look away from, you know? <laughs> like at every step, 
you're like saying from the sidelines, don't do that. Do the other thing. We could save the whole, we could correct course, but, but everyone always makes, makes the, the sort of the personal choice or the total lack of understanding of the personal choice. But that's interesting. That's true. It could be like, oh, that boy, Avshalom, you know, you'll have to deal gently with him. He's still a child, uh, even though he should be a grown man who makes better choices. I definitely, you could hear it that way. Softy that I am, I heard it Tamar's way. <laughs> but I think you're right. Certainly that's how he treats Absalom and, and most of his children um, who all do weird, weird things. But yes, the, the Absalom piece, I think, can't be overlooked, even though, interestingly, even though Yoav kills Absalom, I mean, all but, that is not the crime for which he is being punished, at least on paper. Right. In our parsha, it's about killing Avner and Amasa, who we'll see in one minute, not about um, Avshalom. And I don't know if that's because that would be like weird and inappropriate for David to want personal vengeance as part of his kingdom, or if truly he cares more about Avner and Amasa, sort of to Debbie's point, than he does about his own child. So I think either read is, is totally reasonable. Um, and when we see Amasa's death, I think there are a lot of ways that it sort of feels like an echo of Avner's death. I do also think that they should have named the people with more names that, that did not all begin with Aleph because <laughs> it is very confusing, right? But so just Amasa is um, Avshalom's former general or right was the general of Avshalom before he died. Um, and here they were, um, they were in uh, Givon and Amasa comes before them. Vayov chagor mido levusho. Um, he was wearing his military dress with a sword over it. Um, the alav chagor charev metumedet amatnav, um, fastened around his waist, his waist in its sheath. And as he steps forward, v'ta'ara v'hu yatsa v'tipol, the sword falls out. And you might think like, oh, that's a mistake. But this seems to actually be part of this like weird, like pull him close and then lash out, um, model that Yoav has, uh, because Yoav pretends to be friendly. Yoav um, Hashalom How are you doing? Um, and at that same moment, V'tochaz Yad Yemin Yoav B'zakan Amasa Linchak Lo. He took hold of Amasa's beard as if to kiss him, right? He pulls him close. It's like a very intimate and awkward physical uh, moment of violence. But Amasa lo nishmar, he wasn't ready, right? He wasn't on guard. Right, this is like a much more gruesome in some ways uh, description, but again, he strikes his belly, but now his entrails pour out on the ground and he dies. He did not need to strike him a second time, right? This was strong. It's like almost like a dance, right? He picks up the sword as if he's just gonna put it back in his belt and instead um, kills Amasa. Uh, and I didn't give you all the gory details, but like basically his blood runs into the street. And so you can almost imagine what David is referring to. That like, these are, are intimate, gruesome acts. This is not like a sniper or dispatching a soldier. Yoav does these things up close and personal in a way that blood gets on his belt and blood gets on his shoes. Um, and it is the second time that he kills someone who is a rival of, of Yoav, right? A rival to himself, but also uh, uh, someone who has maybe some like dubious loyalty to David. Like you sort of wonder who is in David's blind spot and is Yoav protecting them? Um, and who actually is a threat to him? So, and this is, is pretty much the end of Yoav's encounters with David. There's like one more weird story about a census, which again, we, we certainly didn't have uh, time for. But it's the last sort of face-to-face -face conversation with, um, with, with David and Yoav. And... This is the end, and I think there are no clear winners and there are no clear losers. Um, but of course, the, the rabbis of the Gemara seem to disagree with me. Um, and it they try to imagine what's going on. They're very troubled by this, um, the incident involving Yoav. Um, and <laughs> they say that um, after, uh, after David dies, um, 
Shlomo HaMelech sends for him, presumably to kill him, right? And somehow Yoav seems to know. And he, he says this weird thing back to, Sh to Shlomo. He says, you cannot perform two actions to this man, i.e. to me, Yoav. If you kill him, this man, i.e. me, you and your descendants will receive the curses with which your father cursed me. And if you do not wish to receive these curses, let him go so that he may receive the curses that which your father cursed him. Right? It's almost as if he's saying, I already received a sentence for my crimes from your father when he gave me these curses about the spindle and the leprosy and, and the uh, being hungry. And so if you try to kill me now, then those curses will fall back to your family. It's a weird conversation, right? It's a weird comeback. It it does seem like Yoav is quite nervous about this, this business, as he should be because Shlomo does it. Um, and so what does Shlomo do? do? Um, Asa kasher diber v'pagabo v'kivrato. He curses his own descendants. And so again, it, like in some ways goes back to this interwoven interdependence between David and Yoav and their families. Um, that one person's curses become the, the you know, the, the curses, curses become the cursed, the cursors, parents, uh, curses. And um, interestingly, a, a lot of the, of David's misery, so to speak, traces back to his own murder adultery right? When he kills Uriah, um, Natan tells him that a calamity will arise from within his own house. And it seems like that calamity is Avshalom, right? So Yoav is the one who dis it dispatches Uriah to die. And then in the end, he has to deal with Avshalom, the sort of curse that arises from that action on David's part. Um, and so the, the, cursings, the curses and blessings are not so easily separated. It seems like the Gemara is saying, we want David Hamelf to be the good guy and Yoav to be the bad guy, but it's just not so clear. Right, war and the weird things that we do during war are just not so clear. And so, in the end, they they spend a lot of time, which I excised for us, um, trying to prove how this happened to all of uh, the house of Shlomo, the curse. And then the Gemara returns to the incident, and they imagine this whole conversation between you know judge and uh, defendant between Shlomo and Yoav, where Shlomo seems to really want to understand. And again, I sort of heavily redacted it just because I think the answers are not nearly as interesting as the questions, right? Shlomo says to Yoav, my Taima, what is the reason that you killed Avner? Right? Even though there are so many reasons, Avner killed Ashel, Avner is a potential political threat, Avner is a personal threat professionally. Um, and you know, Yoav sort of successfully demonstrates why he why he did that, right? Successful uh, argument. But then Shlomo says, but then my time, why did you kill Amasa? And then he says, I, I killed Amasa in punishment for his having rebelled against the king, right? It seems like this is the most compelling argument is that it's not personal. The kingdom was at stake and Yoav is putting, uh, you know, what do they say? Country before family. Um, and he is not willing to spare anything when it comes to that. And it seems to me that that's almost like a reference to Avner, uh, to Avshalom also, to saying like, listen, he was rebelling. We had to punish him. That's sort of the way it had to work. Um, and the Gemara finishes the discussion of Yoav. And this is where I want to leave us with, I'm sorry, there's nothing on this last page. I just couldn't get rid of it. A <laughs> mystery of Google, Google Docs. Um, he says, the Gemara notes, right? And I think that this is really interesting. I'm sorry, the bold and the not bold fell out of my copy and paste, but, but the Gemara, uh, Safari is explaining, right? Those who view Yoav in a negative light. Um, so it seems like, even though that's like the way we want to go, the Gemara can't let go of the fact that maybe that's not it. So they say, the Pliga to Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana, that those people who view Yoav negatively, they disagree with the opinion of Rabbi Abba Bar Kahana because he used to say, Ilema David lo asa Yoav milchama, ve Ilema Yoav lo asak David betora, 
right? That um, were it not for David who studied Torah, Yoav would not have been able to wage war successfully, right? On some level, our, our the, the battle winnings are because of David's merit as a Torah scholar. And if he was not the king, Yoav would be out of a job. But were it not for the military acumen of Yoav, David would not have been able to study Torah, right? If he didn't have a competent general in the field willing to do all of his dirty work for him, he would not have had time to sit in the pal palace and write to Hillam or whatever it was that he was doing um, at that time. And so I think that this, this interdependence is what makes it impossible for him to kill Yoav. David can't really kill him. It's like almost like killing a part of himself, a part of the balance of his um, his success, both his Torah and his military success. And so it's not possible for him. And yet there's something about Yoav that is so troubling that once he's dead, he wants Shlomo to kill him for, you know, he wants Shlomo to kill Yoav for David. And so it, it's just this, it's almost like the murders that Yoav commits. It feels like personal and physical and intimate, but also violent. Um, and it's all hidden there in that one little reference point in our Haftorah. Um, I would love to hear if anyone has questions, if this was clear. I hope it was not too rushed, but also not too long. <laughs> Hard balance there. I, I think that that opening chapter of uh, Malachim Aleph, when I read that, I said, Mario Puzo knows Malachim Aleph because that was just so true to that that, that scene in The Godfather where he's he's giving the command of everybody that, you know, at the um, at the bris, at, at the uh, not the bris, but the baptism of the uh, of this of the uh, baby. Um, everybody is being killed on his orders all over the place. So that was I just felt that Mario Puzo knew Malachim Aleph because he was just fulfilling the, mm. uh, well, you know, what, what David was telling Solomon to do with the enemies. Mm. And isn't that an interesting, um, you know, modern day character to sort of assign to David? I think you're right, though. It's it's fascinating. He was many complicated things. I was thinking of an, another author, a guy named Sophocles, that lived a few thousand years ago. He wrote <laughs> the, the play called Oedipus Rex, Ed, Ed, mm. Oedipus King, which is a guy... Uh, kill his father and sleeps to his life, marries his mother. I think mm. uh, I think Absalom did that uh, at some, some point. But yes, Absalom wanted one of uh, the concubines of, of that. Yeah, the concubines, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but uh, it, it, but but the Jew, the, the Hebrew, the biblical story did not enter the world of literature like a tragedy. And mm. so many, so many, all these confusions, all these, these, these intricacies that you described, that they are so, they're so, so Jewish, so real, so real life. And uh, mm. I think Jonathan Sachs always compares the Jewish story, the biblical stories, the, the, uh, the, 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 the founding fathers and the, the forefathers and uh, the, the, all their sons and wives with the, the Greek tragedies or even Shakespeare's tragedies. Hmm. It was going to happen and it is a real tragedy. There's no Jewish tragedy. There's real life. All this conflict can, going back can, and forth. Uh, we can truly say en kadash takatashames. Mm -hmm. There's nothing new under the sun. Exactly, yeah. I think, I think that you're also, you're bringing up an important point, um, which I want to, I'm, I'm going to pull up just the end of the Haftorah here, because I think Nelson, what I'm hearing you say is like the framing is different than in Oedipus, right? Because what is the end of our Haftorah? Shlomo sat upon the throne of his father, David, and his rule was firmly established. Yeah. And what I hear there is like a triumphant note of victory. And what I think, like what I could imagine if I were the, the you know, the movie director is like, you'd see Yoav's lifeless body, however he'd been executed by the state and sort of stepping over it, Shlomo would put his crown on because it is truly Yoav's actions, which helped make Shlomo's 
throne so established, right? Without Yoav sort of clearing the way of Amasa and Avner and Avshalom and all these other people, it's unclear exactly how established Shlomo would be. And so it almost seems like the ends are, are justified, you know, by the means or we're able to sort of look away from the the tragedy of it to see the the success, but it's it's not easy. I think I sort of trend toward Shakespeare over Navi. <laughs> I would be a terrible king because I would have just been like, look, yo up, just like run away, go to go somewhere else. <laughs> My dad is dead, he'll never know. <laughs> right? Just like just go. <laughs> I, I don't I don't think I would have done it. I don't know. That's probably a terrible note to end on. <laughs> but <laughs> my husband is laughing in the other room. I think look, I think that there is something more real about the Nubby. And maybe that's what I'm uncomfortable with. And that's what drives me to keep learning it, which maybe, right, maybe that's good. Maybe that's what, what keeps us engaged is that David is not perfect. Yoav is not the most straightforward general. Their relationship is not straightforward, but at the end of the day, they both had their eye on the same prize, which was to establish Shlomo. And what happens because of that is the Beit HaMikdash is built. And so, you know, I think life being complicated is very real today and, and every year, not just this year. And so maybe the Navi is here to say, you do the best you can, you try to do the right thing, and you try to do it in the best way possible, but that's not always the way we want. Is that better? <laughs> no. May we, may we, uh, right? What is that insult? May you live in difficult and in, in interesting times when we never have to live in the times uh, of, of Yoav and, and David and Shlomo and all of that complicated behavior. Um, and may we see a, a more peaceful time quickly in our midst. Yeah, she could, right? That's a better way. <laughs> um, and um, I hope everyone has a good week, enjoys this balmy winter weather um, and a good Shabbat. And I will I will be here next Tuesday and then I'll see you next Shabbat, God willing, in, in Skokie. So looking forward to it and have a wonderful week. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming. Bye, guys.